So we have a few objectives for this specific session, namely that we are going to be discussing some of the challenges to student motivation in the online classroom, generally speaking, as well as in this kind of disrupted semester is one way of putting it. We'll also look towards evidence-based approaches to an understanding of student motivation. And finally, we'll be working to develop concrete strategies to support student persistence and sense of belonging in an online classroom and specifically in an online classroom in the context of COVID-19 and having to pivot to online quickly. So to that end, I'm going to ask you to give us a sense, now that you have that framing of what we've identified for today, please add to the chat window if you feel comfortable why you're attending today's session. And if you have something specific that you're hoping to come away with, we'll look to tailor some of our conversation based on what you volunteer. And we'll also follow up with any specific resources if there's something that we don't have the opportunity to address as part of today's session. So please take a moment in that chat window to again, uh, if you feel comfortable, share why you're here um, and what you're hoping to come away with. Okay, a lot of questions about engagement. And for grad students specifically who have uh, a variety of responsibilities that may be different from undergraduate. All right, so a lot speaking directly to this notion of motivation, especially for students with specific needs or expectations based on their majors. Okay, definitely sense of community is something else that we've been hearing from students uh, in terms of a sense of loss, but also sometimes the online classroom being an opportunity to connect um, and to have accountability that can be helpful in this specific context. I also want to point out, and uh, my colleague Beth who's here mentioned as well, that um, yesterday's uh, workshop on engaging students in Zoom, um, that we have a, a recording available for that, um, and it's something that I can share. Okay, counteracting Zoom fatigue. <laughs> I both like and uh, uh, am concerned by that term, but yes, yes, definitely, I've been hearing that as well. Thank you for sharing these thoughts, and I hope we'll be able to address um, many of them in the next, I suppose it's about 50 minutes or so. Anything that we either are unable to address or you feel hasn't been addressed in the way that you were hoping for. Um, again, we will be following up not just with this recording, but also with some further resources based on what we're hearing from you now. And you can also follow up with myself and Megan um, and our colleagues at the Poor View Center to uh, receive one-on-one -on -one support. And I'll point that out once more at the end of our session today. All right, so let me speak for a moment uh, about the lay of the land. I'm guessing that all of this is no doubt very familiar to you at this point, um, but I just want to uh, address it a, or really, again, lay it out there for you as we continue in this session. So in terms of the Yale context right now, which as you are uh, very well aware is one where you've had to quickly move into teaching remotely. And I continue to be impressed by faculty resiliency in this context. Um, we've been hearing both from you and from students a little bit about what this change feels like. Um, that students, and some of these are definitely true from what I've been hearing from faculty as well, but from students we've been hearing um, about feeling afraid of the current situation, concern about loss of income, um, having to care for a uh, sick family, uh, as well as the potential issue of technology inequity, um, access or maybe uh, strong access to internet, um, access to laptops or other things that students may or may not have with them, given how quickly they had to change their situation. We've also been hearing a lot about senses of uh, isolation, feeling physically or emotionally overwhelmed. And uh, also, I've heard from both students and faculty, this issue of not having the same mode of receiving feedback that for faculty, they may feel they can't gauge as well. Are students understanding? Are students participating or engaged in the same way in this new teaching and learning and context? And I've been hearing from some students as well that they 
don't feel they have the same gauge on how they're doing in the class and whether or not they're meeting the expectations in this new context. I'll add to this that the online environment is obviously different for teaching and learning, um, that it frequently entails a higher level of personal accountability um, and kind of self-determination, as well as that it, the online environment can feel a little colder. Um, it is also one where it is not as easy to build community. And finally, part of the reason why we are looking to student motivation now in week three and not necessarily hosting this in week one is in part due to the fact that now you have a somewhat greater understanding, I hope, of what your class looks like, um, what you and your students are capable of in this new environment. And we also now have a better sense of what the remainder of the semester entails. And I'm guessing that for those in Yale College who've seen Dean Chun's email regarding universal pass and grading policy. And so we now have at our disposal a better sense of what the rest of the semester looks like and how we, or what we desire to be an outcome of it. All right, at this point, I'm gonna pause for a moment to hand it over to my colleague, Megan Bathgate, and allow her to introduce herself. Just wanna make sure I didn't miss anything in the chats. Megan, if you're ready. I'm ready. Hello, so I'm Megan Bathgate, um, as Victoria mentioned. So I am the Associate Director of Educational Program Assessment at the Porvoo Center. Um, and this topic is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I am a, a cognitive psychologist and my specialty is student motivation. So here we are. <laughs> um, and it's, it's something that I, I enjoy talking about. So hopefully you'll be able to, to dig in a bit today, today and figure out how we can best support you and in turn best support your students. Um, so I want to start with um, a couple of, I'm actually going to need to share my screen. All right. I got a thumbs up from Victoria. That means we're in, we're in good shape. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let's start with uh, talking a little bit about the process and impact of motivation. So uh, what I've done is think about patterns that we see across different motivational uh, theories and think about some of the common factors that they all bring up. Um, and this is not to get too bogged down in, in literature, but to really think about where this is coming from and what is the evidence behind these kinds of strategies that we will be talking about. Um, so one thing we can think about is what do we want to come from motivation? And so a lot of times we talk about the importance of motivation being related to student learning, uh, their persistence in their learning or in their uh, field of, of study. Uh, as well as their identity. So as they become motivated and they learn, they kind of tend to reinforce their um, identity in different ways. And so we know that engagement and motivation is related to these outcomes um, and that they reinforce each other. So when you are more, more motivated, you tend to engage more and kind of this positive cycle happens where you can hopefully, ideally gain more knowledge as you go. Um, However, that's not the only piece. So this, as it stands here, is very focused on the student and what is happening there, but it does take place in the context. So the way in which learning is framed, what it means to learn, what it means to be successful, um, the role of the student in that environment varies from university to university, across developmental ages, uh, across classrooms, even within Yale. Um, so the way that you speak as an instructor about learning and frame what it means to learn and, and where the responsibility lays and kind of what is the outcome of that learning is really all part of how a student then engages and what motivations you kind of raise to the forefront for them. And this is all embedded in students' prior knowledge and prior experience. So they're coming with an expectation of, I've never learned online, what does this mean for me potentially? Or maybe they have and they loved it, or maybe they have and they hated it. So they're bringing something beyond just this context. And so a lot of the motivational theories look at this. So when we talk about motivation, it's not just motivation in this moment for this thing, it really exists in this larger framework of students' um, current motivation to engage and then cycle through 
uh, this kind of pattern. So these are very much wiggly <laughs> is the term that I like to use. Um, these kinds of outcomes, the more you learn, that then becomes your prior experience, which then reinforces how you think about learning in different contexts, which, and then, which then informs engagement and motivation and so on. So that is my maybe 90 second spiel on motivational theory in general. What I wanna talk about um, is the unique nature of this experience. So being in a pandemic is not um, uh, something that the motivational literature has tons of research about. So what it does speak to is what stressors can do to learning. So the cognitive psychology uh, literature is full of that. And so what we know about these kinds of stressors is that it actually suppresses um, self-regulation techniques and um, consolidation of new content, for example. So there's a lot of things that can happen here that I want to work into our conversation so that we think about the importance of not just framing our learning for students right now, but framing our learning within this context and giving voice to that. And we'll talk about how that action and that intention relates to supporting student motivation. So I want to dive a little bit down into one particular theory uh, or framework uh, called self-determination theory. And this is really thinking about how students um, or anyone really can uh, have a sense of goal setting, achieving their goals, staying motivated to develop towards those goals. Uh, it really relates to um, when somebody is self-determined, uh, they tend to have a sense of strong belonging, strong competence, and strong autonomy. And so we'll talk about what that means. And the reason that I'm pausing here and going through these um, is not to give you a big lecture on, on theory, but to actually frame strategies within evidence-based principles. So what we're going to do is go through each of these and think about strategies that link to, to each. And these are things that are in the theory pulling from um, learning science, education, uh, psychology, educational psychology, cognitive psychology. And there's lots of data that show that these different elements relate to learning and um, increases in motivation subsequently. So kind of getting, getting students to be on that positive uh, cycle, so to speak, about motivation. So let me just define these quickly. They're a little self-explanatory, so uh, I don't need to spend too much time here. But belonging is really that students have a sense of um, being connected within a community and that they are valued in that community. And so you can think about um, when this goes well in a class, you have students who are collaborating, who are supporting each other. It's easy to have discourse. It's easy to kind of have discussions. When it's not going well, you can feel it, I think, as well, where students are kind of resistant. There's always kind of a stop, start kind of feel. Um, and I think some of us sense that even moving online. Um, and we can talk about the consequence of that on, on belonging. Competence is students' sense of uh, their efficacy when challenged. So do they feel like they can rise to this challenge and meet it well? Do they feel confident in doing um, the activity that, that is being asked of them? And autonomy. So autonomy is really students' sell, uh, sense of choice and control over their own goals. Okay, so if we pause and we think about this particular context in the sense of COVID and of this pandemic and remote learning, all three of these are, are kind of under threat right now a little bit. So um, student sense of belonging is disrupted in some way through, through not having that physical space with each other. Uh, their competence, what does it mean to be successful? How am I going to be sure that I can still be the student that I want to be and achieve the things I want to, being this removed and with all of the open questions that are still here? Um, and autonomy is something I think we're all struggling with right now, uh, a sense of choice and control um, given the situation of what it takes to stay safe and, and help each other out here. So <laughs> let's move to concrete strategies here. And I haven't been checking the chat. So if I'm missing anything, Victoria, feel free. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's start with belonging. Um, as we move through these, I want to mention that uh, these are not uh, mutually exclusive. So there can be uh, instances in which people can have a sense of the same strategies may hit on belonging, as well as competence and autonomy. So there's a little bit that you can think about this as although I'm going through them sequentially, they're very much reinforcing each other in many ways. So we'll talk about instances of that as well. 
Okay. So first, <laughs> this may be obvious, and I know that many faculty have already done this. Um, so I want to uh, take the time to um, make sure that we all have done this in some way with our students. So we want to be sure that we acknowledge the fact that we're in this situation. And perhaps that seems obvious, and it might be obvious enough or feel obvious enough to just not do. <laughs> but I think this the, the, in the literature shows acknowledging the situation, giving voice that this is happening and acknowledging that this is hard and we're all adjusting and we're all in it together reinforces that sense of community for students. And also relatedly, checking in with students as human beings. So this can be anything. This is a very broad umbrella for many, many strategies. This can be something as concrete as I have a class of, of six students and we meet in a seminar and I'm, I've called each one of them or Zoomed with each one of them. It's harder in, in larger classes to be doing that if you are one person with a class of 200, for example. So when I, when I say check in, I mean both individual check ins when possible, or maybe if you know some students are particularly struggling in some way, it's good to reach out. But you can check in with students through your language as well, leaving that door open that they know that you are, you share the same goals as them, that you support their learning that you are someone who they can reach out to. Um, and just the way that you frame, again, framing that um, learning experience in that learning community for them. Uh, and this actually relates to building trust. So we have data coming from the Porvoo Center, which I didn't cite here, so I will follow up with those, with those links. But um, we have some data that shows that when students feel that they can trust their instructor, that they feel that their instructor values them, that they share the same goals as them, that they care about them as human beings. Even in the big class, this degree of trust can still be there. Um, we find that that trust relates to how much students engage and how much they subsequently learn. Um, and so this trust happens when you speak to them as human beings, speak to the situation that is occurring, and think about how you can um, demonstrate care and um, value to them. And again, this doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, you reaching out to every single student, but in the way that you talk about learning and the way that you talk about how you approach learning, making those things transparent can engender that trust. Um, also encouraging peer connection. So again, you are one person, sometimes too many, many students, you're not alone in, in kind of serving that need of building the community. And so considering how you can leverage the, the group uh, to be uh, a developed community together is another way to think about this. So accountability buddy is, is a term that Victoria introduced me to and uh, I love it. So thinking about would it be helpful in your course to think about linking up students or particular groups of students to check in with each other, see what they're confused about, see how life is going, are they safe, are they healthy? So uh, um, the fact that you would even have this conversation with your students about doing it shows that you have their interest in mind. Um, so keep that in mind as, as you're going through. And I would encourage you, whether you do peer groups or, or however you play this out, to provide some guidelines. Um, so just saying meet with each other and have a good time isn't necessarily gonna do the work that you really want it to. So be explicit about what the expectations are and what the rationale is for why you would have these kinds of group uh, dynamic interactions. Another big, uh, point that we advocate for, not just in remote learning, but also in general. Uh, students really feel a sense of belonging when they feel invested, involved, and heard in the classroom. And so this is motivating to them, right? If they are giving and hearing and seeing their own contributions in the class kind of come to life, that's a way for them to feel a sense of belonging and feel motivated to contribute. Um, so this can be very simple as, as intermittently doing chats and getting feedback and saying, I'm seeing in the Zoom chat X, Y, Z, or using a, a Canvas discussion board if you do asynchronous learning, which I know many of you likely are doing. Um, uh, and I, I want to point out here that you can ask for it, and that alone is helpful, but it is much, much, much more powerful when you bring it back to the classroom. So acknowledge the fact that you've looked at it, you value it, and and talk about how you might change your teaching or adjust something based on that feedback. And understand that you might not change anything based on the feedback. Students sometimes make requests that aren't in line with what you want the course to do. Um, and it's okay to say, I hear you saying you really want this. Here's why I'm going to pause on that and not do it right now. 
So just being aware that you can open the door without, you know, completely giving up all, all control or autonomy for yourself about how you run your class. And so these are just some examples of how you can cultivate belonging, which in turn um, helps with uh, students' sense of motivation in your class in your course. The last note that I have here is journaling. So another way to do this is have students reflect on their um, experience and what this means for them. And this is maybe easy to do in some courses and very difficult to do in others. Um, so think about your own content and where this makes sense. Um, but I would say that one way to show and reinforce this sense of, of care is um, valuing their contribution with some credit. Is, is often helpful. So acknowledging the fact that this isn't just busy work for you. I want you to think about this deeply and I care about it so much. <laughs> and I, and here's why I want to give you a little bit of credit for doing that. That's just one way that you could consider it. Um, I'm going to pause here and move on to competence. Uh, Victoria, just flag me if, if there's any. Okay, awesome. So we'll move on. And then I, I do want to acknowledge, speaking of the chat, that there are a number of ways uh, to build in practices around this within a particular Zoom talk, if you're using Zoom. And that really um, is covered in a great way from this session um, yesterday. And so I just want to acknowledge the fact that if you're, if you're here saying, I really want to learn how to do polling in Zoom so that I can make sure my students are intermittently reengaged, that we have those resources for you. Um, so hang tight, <laughs> we will send them. Um, and hopefully, uh, I'll point out where I see links uh, among a few of these strategies as well. Okay, so competence. So this is, uh, a, this is where students kind of raise their concern. <laughs> uh, they're panicked, right? How do I do a good job? What does it mean? I don't know if I can do this. How am I going to do this while I'm also at home? Bad internet access, responsibility for, for family or family who are, who are struggling in a number of ways or could be right now. Um, help them stay grounded <laughs> to, to reflect on the fact that they, they have experience in ways that um, they can recall and bring forward. So they got here to your course. They've done some things before break. Remind them that they have done that, right? So it can be a little panic, uh, panic inducing, thinking just forward to the end of the semester. But reflect back and let them know, you know what, when you started, we didn't cover any of this, but look at what we've covered so far. And you've done this. And here's what we're doing moving forward. And so thinking about it rather than one big thing, really thinking about it in chunks, which is something we'll talk about in a minute, um, can be helpful in reinforcing what they've already achieved in the course. This is a big one, and, and Victoria hinted at this. So, Confidence, what it means to succeed right now in your course might look different to you. It might look different to your students than it first did when you started. Um, and maybe it looks the same, but being clear and not making the assumption that your student knows exactly what to expect, defining for them what it means to be successful in your course and specifically how to get there. So how to move forward through those steps so that they can meet the level of achievement that they want to. Um, don't assume that they know. <laughs> uh, and then also consider pivoting assignments to engage directly with the circumstances that are happening right here. And this is actually something that we talked about in a previous continuity community session on assessments. And we will be talking about next week and thinking about how to adjust assessments given um, a, either a different structure, a different mode than you thought, or potentially different content than you thought about covering. Um, this might be, again, really easy in some courses, really difficult and challenging in others. Uh, I encourage you to think creatively about it. And we are here, the Corby Center is here to help you do that. So if you have a very specific request that you would like to talk one-on-one, -on -one, we'll have a little bit of time at the end of this session, but we are also very happy to follow up if you, if you have questions here. Um, a point that I wanna make here, especially uh, given the, the message on the um, universal pass, uh, fail option is there's an opportunity right now to be creative and think about this for your students, how to keep them motivated at a time where they may have questions about what it means to be successful and, and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, the more that you can connect it to things that they're experiencing and valuing for either their short-term or long-term goals, the more that you can have them bring themselves into the classroom is going to, to reinforce that motivation. Just a note there, we can talk about more specifics in a moment. And then referring back to something that I talked about a couple minutes ago about chunking. So 
uh, this is a, a common cognitive psychology approach where when you look at any given task or a semester or any amount of time, it can be really overwhelming. And so students are kind of thinking forward to the end of semester and what does this mean and what am I going to do and what about the fall and oh my goodness, uh, breaking it down and saying, okay, to be successful this week, here's what you need to do. To think about rather than really one big task, breaking it down into smaller chunks can help students ha handle it in a more manageable way. But also what it does, which is terrific, is it reinforces their accomplishments. So when they're successful over that week, they now have something to point to as being successful, which they can move forward with. So it really scaffolds their sense of confidence as they move. All right, gonna move on to autonomy. Uh, and here I wanna say, um, there's a couple uh, examples here that I just talked about. So here's, here's really concrete ways that you can think about doing the same uh, broad approaches and meeting a few of these. So encouraging chunking is not just something that can help students feel confident, but also gives them a sense of autonomy and control. So if they think about, you know, the end of the semester, into the summer, into the fall, they might feel a loss of control, a loss of, and, and as, as um, staff and faculty at Yale, we probably also feel this, a, a sense of like, but, but when and how and if and, and all of these questions, and that really does push on our autonomy. So thinking, okay, here's my daily schedule. Here are the things that are happening this week. It helps us understand what we, what we can do effectively right now and keeps us grounded and moving forward. Um, and again, asking and adjusting for student feedback allows them, allows students to have a sense of autonomy in your class uh, at a time where they may feel more disruptive. Um, I think all of you have probably already done this to some extent, because here we are on Zoom, um, but allowing for flexibility and adaptability for student circumstances um, can be something that is useful in a broad way, but very specifically for a given assignment. So you could, for example, allow students to, to pivot their topic. Um, we've talked with faculty who, um, whose students have, have lost access to direct material that they were planning on using for their resources, for a report, their projects. So thinking about, um, for example, some faculty have talked about making it then a story and a narrative about access. Um, how can you talk about the content that is um, within your course in the framework of what it means to do have access to that kind of direct material. For example, that's just one way that we've seen that um, play out. So being uh, allowing within reason what works for you, for your TFs, um, to really think about what is appropriate, where can you allow student flexibility, and defining why, and the expectations around those really help them to, to um, preserve that motivation that, that uh, brought them to your course in the first place. And really, this is a big one, this last one, uh, connecting the students' values um, and empowering them to have a sense of bringing themselves into the classroom. Uh, students take our courses for many reasons, and sometimes they heard you're a great faculty member and they wanted to take it. Sometimes they just love the content of your course and can't get enough, and hopefully that's the case for everyone, but we know that some students are coming in because they really just need it for a grade. Um, or to get on to the next course. And so recognizing the fact that your students are coming with really different motivations and that these motivations are actually predictive of different ways of engaging and different ways of learning uh, is important to acknowledge. And so there may be students whose motivation may diminish quicker than others if they're not immediately drawn to the content. So thinking of ways that you can engage them, and I'm gonna point directly back to yesterday's session on engaging in, in um, Zoom. So if, if you do synchronous or even small group um, Zoom sessions, opportunities for students to um, do polling, for example, or chats or hear what people are doing, that kind of building in that community throughout um, is a way to keep them engaged where their attention may, may float. Um, so those are a few ways that, that we wanted to talk about this. And I want to stop because I know that what I've done here is really talk about some big umbrella um, approaches, but I want to think about your courses now and, and kind of more concrete strategies that you may use for the particular challenge that you're having. So I'm going to stop sharing, Victoria, and, and toss it back to you. Great. Uh, so I'm going to leave the screen as is for a moment here um, and ask now we're moving into the question and answer portion of today's continuity community workshop. So 
I want to, we've given you a lot of food for thought, so I'll give you a moment to absorb, but then would love to hear your questions, your comments, 